It is one thing for a patient like me, a patient advocate, uh, people like me, to participate in a conference. It is another to go in and represent with my own personal experience what might be a common experience to others similar to my experience dealing with the kind of disease that I deal with. And so I was not alone. There were a total of six of us asked to present, and we were equals in a room with a variety of different healthcare professionals from the various CERT centers around the country, really taking a look at strategic and specific issues as it relates to helping people stay on a medical regimen involving medications. And for me as a patient, not just a patient advocate, but for a patient, to really understand that there really is a strategy behind this, that the patient brings one part of that to the table and part of the management of the disease um, means that the researcher, the academician, the policy holder, even the funders of that research, along with the patient, um, in the best kind of environment, it would be great to have all of those perspectives together. And that's what that workshop did. It was a unique opportunity. We, I think we said, we as patients said a lot of things that researchers and payers really maybe, maybe had thought about, but really had not incorporated into further strategic thinking. So it was um, an eye-opening experience for me and as I experience an eye-opening experience for the rest of the participants. When I was 17 years old, I started having what I thought were pains in my chest. And anyone at that time, especially as a 17-year-old, um, would think that that was heart-related, and I thought it was heart-related. At that time, I was a very active uh, teenager. I swam, golfed, played tennis. Uh, I would climb trees regularly in a heartbeat. Uh, and I was very active socially. Uh, and I was good in school. I had no problems with school. Uh, and when these pains came about, I never told my parents until I, mean, I was having difficulty breathing. Um, and I could not get out of bed because of the movement of my chest. And so when I finally told my parents, um, we went to see my uncle, who is an internal medicine doctor. He first thought that I was just being too active. So he gave me a shot of cortisone in the sternum area of my chest, thinking that, whatever, the inflammation would go away. Um, it did not. It only, actually only got worse. That then led to a second visit within the same week where he did some blood tests and it came out positive for rheumatoid factor and rheumatoid arthritis. When he told me I have a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, I did not hear the word rheumatoid. I had never heard of that before. What I heard was arthritis. And in those days, arthritis is for old people. Uncle, what are you talking about? That's for old people. To which his response was, as a trusting uncle, he brought out the textbook on rheumatology arthritis diseases, opened it up, had me flip through pages where I began to see deformed fingers and toes and knees, and immediately I went into denial. That cannot be me. That's not me. The action was he put me on 26 aspirin a day immediately, uh, which did not help whatsoever. In fact, caused all kinds of problems, and that was just the beginning of a downfall. I was just a subsequent increasing pain increasing functional disability, uh, not wanting to walk first, and then not being able to walk, not wanting to reach up, and then not even wanting to reach at all. So it was a slow closing of my body inward, uh, as well as the depression that started to appear. When, when a 17, 18-year-old deals with pain throughout the day and night, your whole life changes. Um, I was not my active self. I was not my lively, uh, joke-telling person, you know, young adult that I used to be. 
uh, and I started to shut down in so many ways. The disease was taking more of a hold. I would go back to my doctor. We would try different medications, and trying different medications was usually a three to five month process. Let's see if this works. Let's see if that works. Nothing really worked. Ultimately, I ended up in a wheelchair. And what was difficult it was is by the time, and I had to stop school. So just, you know, graduating from high school is one thing. Trying to go on to school when everybody else your age is off to school is very different. For me, I started school but had to stop. Had to go back home to my family where they took care of me. And my job every day was to transfer out of bed into a wheelchair because mom and dad were, are working age people and they had to leave. And my mom would leave breakfast or lunch, whatever I asked for, at the dining room table with a little wrap over it. And my job every day was to get out of bed, transfer to the wheelchair, figure out how to get into the bathroom, do my duty there, and traverse in a chair down the length of the hallway to the table. At that time, I was not really reaching for anything. I was in so much pain, I was holding myself all the time. So the ability to eat with a fork or a spoon required so much movement of shoulders, elbows, wrist, and hand, I couldn't do it. So I ate like a little puppy dog. I would lower my face to the food and have my mom already cho have it chopped up to eat. And that was what I did. And there's nothing more demoralizing when you realize that you're at home alone eating like a puppy dog. And I realize that uh, if I don't do something about this, I will be like this for the rest of my life. The worst of it was I shut out my friends. I did not want them to see me. Uh, my aunts and uncles took pity on me, and I didn't want that. I really didn't want pity. So it was years before I began to realize that I needed to do something, that if I didn't do something, nothing was going to change. So what I did was innocuously, just with really without any pre-thought, at the next doctor's visit, I asked my doctor, how come you've never asked me if I want to get out of this wheelchair? To which his response was, eyes open, step back, I took a step back. And I realized that to me was, he doesn't know what my goals are. That is exactly my goal. So I said, you know, my goal is to get out of this wheelchair. Now, what will it take to do this? And he said, well, you're going to need uh, joint replacements, and you're going to need a lot of them. First time I'd ever heard that word, did not know what it meant. And I said, OK, where do we start? <laughs> it was a lot better agreeing to do something that I didn't know what it was than the status quo. That's the kind of position I was in emotionally, mentally, and certainly physically. He then subsequently put me in touch with an orthopedic surgeon. I call him my uh, orthopod 101 to give me a general background as to what would it take to get Amy to stand up. <laughs> and that meant going through lots of surgeries. Uh, since then, I've had 26 surgeries. 16 of those were joint replacement surgeries. I have been literally rebuilt. That called for 297 days in the hospital, over 17 or 18 years now. But that allowed me to be able to stand up. I had to reawaken atrophied muscles, because that's what happens when you don't use your body, they, it, your muscles atrophy. So it was not just about the actual surgery time in a hospital. It was the months and months and months of rehabilitation to be able to be, to self-motivate, to motivate myself to say, okay, I have to do these series of exercises today, not tomorrow, but today and not skip it. If I want to stand up and walk as if I can walk normally again, this is what I have to do. So I had to take a look at what motivated me. 
and this was the beginnings of my becoming a motivational speaker, quite frankly, that I realized that I had some, I needed to be incentivized to do so. That was, I suppose, the game part of it for me. I had to make it interesting. So I've used salami as a motivator. I wouldn't think that that would be good nutritionally, but you know, good Italian salami is hard to come by. Um, uh, uh, having spa days, getting a facial, uh, having my friends take me out on a picnic, things like that became motivators if I did, you know, five exercises, different types of exercise a day, if I did a week worth of exercise, those kinds of things. So I had to learn for myself how to motivate myself to prepare for the surgery and then after surgery, the recovery process of that and how to learn literally how to walk again. And I'm happy to say I've done all that. Well, patient-centered care and patient-centered research to me is the, one of the most important areas that I'm happily and actively engaged in today. And the reason is, is this is an area where I can actually see progress uh, as a patient. And not just in my disease, but in the totality of dealing with patients in general. So patient-centered care and patient-centered research are really about engaging in patients from the very beginning. Uh, of care, of research, and creating a research concept to the very end of completing that research, but having patient engagement all along. No longer are we should be just the petri dish that after a researcher has developed the concept and figured out the paradigm and the, and the plan that they might engage a patient or two to see if that works. Patient-centered care means, to me in research, involving the patient from the very beginning. Let's test out and let's talk about and discuss if the concepts that the researcher is talking about are relevant to patients, are practical, is the implementation practical for patients like me. Uh, I have been caught, because I raised my hand to do a variety of different studies, caught doing 12 to 15 to 20 page questionnaires. And for someone with hand involvement, like I have, it's ridiculous, it's, um, it, it hurts. It actually, cause, actually causes more pain. So patient-centered care, patient-centered research to me is helping the patient be a part of the paradigm. Not that I have to have a PhD or an MD degree, but I have to be able to willingly vocalize my experience in a way that makes sense and is understandable to the researcher. So that researcher can pick out those things that from a research standpoint really hit home and might create that great research question. That's where the dynamics of that interaction really shine and really sparkle for me. So I'm delighted to participate. I think what's interesting is if you're looking at medications management, let's say, for example, because it has to be a little more specific than that, is that um, rheumatoid arthritis unfortunately carries with it fatigue. I get tired, and I, I get tired at times when I don't want to be tired, but I have to deal with it. And if I don't deal with it, the next day or the next few hours can make things worse for me, which means increased pain. Um, and so my ability to be flexible is very, very important to my viability all throughout a day. I sit in a lot of meetings, I have to get on airplanes and travel a lot, and I have learned to take uh, naps immediately on airplanes. As a researcher, these are important things for you to know about me that I have to deal, this is my only way of trying to figure out how to deal with some of the things that you don't see as a researcher. You see Amy, but you don't see my fatigue. I have to deal with fatigue. These are, if fatigue is important to you and if you're studying fatigue, I wanna share all of the little self-help strategies I've had to create for myself to make sure I'm up to game, so to speak. I'm up to par with people uh, in my field who do what I do. And so that conversation with the researcher 
uh, in a research development environment is extremely important. Um, what makes you tick? Now, what makes me tick may not make someone else tick, another person with rheumatoid arthritis. And that's part of the range of things. That's when we find out, well, Amy, are you the only one who's experiencing that? Or is this a mainstay of people in this who people of people who experience this disease so that's part of the research question um, sexuality issues uh, uh, how we talk about arthritis um, how do we do work and be as productive as we can when a disease is always trying to cut us down it's those kinds of things that are, may or may not be researchable if you will uh, topics for research but there's a variety of different things by just sitting down and talking to a group of us almost like a focus group and I hate to bring up the word focus group because it has connotations of just being you know touched like uh, 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 something in a petri dish but to, for that patient to be a part of that and I've had the great opportunity of being involved in many research projects from the very very beginning and it has changed people's look and viewpoint over this disease that I personally experience uh, in ways that has helped them do better research. And that this is their comments back to me. So I'm sure I'm not the only one out there who's experiencing it. I'm sure researchers who engage patients from the very beginning are not the only ones who experience that. I would like to see the entire world engage patients like this from the very, very beginning to the very end, if there is an end to research because that's where we get much more relevant, much more precise, and much more practical. For me, as a patient, CERTS is a very unique opportunity to engage the patient voice in research, in planning, uh, and in collaborating not only asserts a collaborative function among top institutions across a variety of different disciplines, but also the process of communication and technology and how patients make decisions. So it's not just disease specific, but it's the process of how we can become better educated as patients. But to actually engage patients in the work, in the institutions, and then at the national level, of certs engaging patients in the steering committee and so I'm delighted to be a part of that and I think that's a critical part that certs has been a role model in and a leader and an innovator is to show that first of all it can be done that it does change the voice so it's not just the voice of an educator not just the voice of a researcher but it's a combined voice of stakeholders that makes more sense much more effective much more relevant. That certs, and I love it. It was a long fight to go into a wheelchair. Once I got into a wheelchair, I never thought I would get out. But I was determined, and being able to share how I was feeling, uh, share my goals, talk to others, get my healthcare team with me, behind me uh, to move me forward was very, very important. Yes, I was crippled. I was in a wheelchair. Yes, I was on a lot of different medications. Yes, I was on Social Security disability. But the turnaround was going through every single joint replacement. Something in me became stronger physically, but also emotionally. I became much more resolute. I became much more communicative. So as a patient, and then a patient advocate, and then a patient advocate leader, I was exposed to so many different opportunities because I was patient engaged and in a patient-centered environment that I was either created or asked to participate in. So I have spoken at the White House. I have received awards at the White House. Uh, I, I am a spokesperson for United Nations Health Initiative. I have traveled the world and talked with ministers of health. I have received awards. I'm an author. Uh, I'm a motivational speaker. And all this is because I decided that my life was so much better as a patient advocate than just a patient. And so I've learned that there is a pathway for any patient to be a patient advocate 
to do better for themselves, do much more for others, and be happy about all of that because you're a part of the solution. That's what it's all about.